uh, well, let's take a break before we go back to palpociclib because it's interesting to just talk a little bit because you just brought this up, what the proper hormonal therapy in the absence of palbo is right now. I mean, I think we, as, as Joyce just said, we talked about first, which is a fa randomized phase two of uh, fulvestrin at 500 versus an astrazole at one milligram where there's a clear survival benefit. It's a small phase two nonetheless, and we, you know, Falcon is a bigger trial that's, ran that's you know, controlled. It's, uh, it's double blinded. And so is, is that enough? The first question I want to ask is, and we'll go back to Pablo in a minute, but is that enough the first data to change your practice? Edith, are you going to put everybody on Fulvestre right now up front? No. You know, we've learned over the years that randomized phase two okay. sometimes do not tell us the whole story. Okay. So I think it's very important for us to know those data so that we can properly follow what happens with the phase three. Carlos, same thing? Uh, <laughs> Yes, I agree, but one interesting, one aspect of this question is the fact that because of FIRST and because of the fact that we know that fulvestrin can work in patients that in tumors that have progressed after estrogen deprivation with an AI, because we know that that ER can reactivate, can have a function without ligand, it, it kind of makes sense, right? biological sense, right? And I will tell you, for this reason is that if you go back the last three years, Fulvestrin became the partner of all these targeted therapies. Yes. It wasn't no longer an AI, but it was Fulvestrin and a PA3K inhibitor. It was Fulvestrin and a CDK4 inhibitor. I think in part it was because of those data and because of the biology. So, so I, I, so, so I think it's the right partner yeah. <laughs> of these drugs. Is it mm -hmm. the first? Uh, is, it, is, 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 is it the first line single agent? Uh, I think it would make sense to me too. So, Denise, a question for you. The, so the issue here now is assuming, again, that the benefit is substantial, which we don't know because we haven't seen the data yet, um, in Paloma 3, one of, the, one of the, I mean, a lot of women in the U.S. relapse when they're on an aromatase inhibitor. So would, then, would that be your first-line therapy then, would be if Palbo plus Fulvestrant in those women? For the patients that were on aromatase inhibitor, well, aromatase inhibitor, I think it, it would be a logical choice to move that right into that setting. Um, we don't have data uh, that I think we were speaking about about adding palbo to a patient on an AI who's failing, um, but we have, you know, what we think is going to be good data at least from the press release that fulvestrant would be, you know, a, a good choice for those patients in that setting. Well, it's oncology by press release. <laughs> um, but anyway, any other comments before we move on? Yeah, Carlos. <clears throat> I think if if we subscribe uh, that to, to the notion that Palvo works specifically by an anti-ER mechanism, okay, which could be, it may be that you can use this as a single agent against ER, in ER positive yep. tumors, mm -hmm. and right. that may spare some anti-ER toxicity. So actually, let me ask a question because this just came to me. Actually, it's fascinating. You just raised that. Would it be better to do intrinsic subtyping? Would it work best in a luminal A intrinsic subtype in the absence of an ER? You know, suppose you did intrinsic subtyping yeah. on a tumor and it was luminal A. You think that would work best? It's on a it? great hypothesis to test. To test. I'm just curious. <laughs> I'm, I'm, raising that, I'm raising that to the yeah. people. I don't know the answer. I'm just, I think it's yeah. a, you just raise that because yeah. it's an ER. I just thought of that when you were talking about that. Yeah. 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 I must say, you, you're, you know, crossing over the line between the clinical validity or analytical validity of a test and the clinical utility of a test. Correct. Uh, so some studies will be needed here. Right, I agree. <laughs> and that gets us actually to the whole next section, yeah. which is good. Yeah. It's a good segue to the next section. Yeah. I mean, I think right now one of the things that we've learned from more registry trials than anything um, has really been the fact that there is a substantial amount of uh, relapse in ER positive, their ER positive adjuvant early stage breast cancer. Uh, then we then probably half of those women actually will relapse between years five and ten, and so we now have extended endocrine therapy starting you know almost or more than ten years ago with letrozole after five years of tamoxifen. We now have ten years of tamoxifen versus five uh, that appears to have a benefit. Um, and so the question is really the first question is do you think it's going to hold true for aromatase inhibitors? We have NSABP B42, which still has not announced. I think after three or four years already. Um, let's start with that. I mean, do you think this is going to hold true for adjuvant aromatase inhibitors? I'll start with Denise. Do you think it's going to hold true? We have to predict B42 right now. 
I, I think there's a great possibility it could. I, I certainly know that I have patients um, when we get to, and I'm very clear on counseling them when the data's at five years for these patients. Um, but even extrapolating, you know, for me, looking at mechanism of action or even kind of looking back at where MA17, you know, following 10 years with five years of tamoxifen and followed by the aromatase inhibitor, and then that trial has gone on, um, I think it's a good chance. Um, the hard part is, you know, how do you counsel the patients about that? And how do you monitor for the long-term effects for the aromatase inhibitors? There's a um, oral presentation, I believe, which I just was looking at the abstracts, I believe it's called Later, from the Australian New Zealand group, and it's for folks that had finished up five years. Now, not all had AIs, but some had AIs and some had TAM, and they were out like two, three, four years down the road, then they were randomized to AI versus, uh, I can't remember if it's placebo or not, but anyway, it's a positive trial in favor mm -hmm. of so some really, there's a some, AI, yeah. really. So some of them it had it wasn't a huge percentage. I want to say twenty percent. I'll have to double check, but I believe it's an oral presentation. So because I made a mental note that aha, mm -hmm. a little bit of extended mm -hmm. adjuvant AI data will be the first. So mm -hmm. I believe you know maybe that's why it's being highlighted here. But I my sense is um, as well that um, that some these some of these patients and this is the big trick of course is to find out. Who, you know, is there such a thing as permanent senescence in some of these? You know, is, is that really true? With prolonged inhibition of cell cycle, do you get senescence so that those patients really don't need anything anymore, you know, versus those who have some ability to still still wake up, you know? And that's what we really are ultimately going to need, you know, because you don't you know, one pill a day for life for everybody is probably not going to end up being ideal.